Well, a very good evening to you. Rather like London buses, twice in a row, but uh, no flowers this week. And we turn back to the prophet Micah, and this week to chapter 3, under the heading, Isn't the Lord Among Us? I can't promise you flowers, as I said, but I can promise you some figurative cannibalism, a sunset for preachers, some bribes, and a city full of weeds. What a lineup! It's not a passage for the faint-hearted. And yet, in the midst of it all, the Spirit of the Lord is speaking, and speaking through the prophet Micah, whom he has filled with power. Now, we pick up where we left off last time with Paul, with the prophetic warnings uh, ringing in our ears, yet also with a glimmer of hope, the promise that God would gather together uh, a remnant of people, enough, as Paul said, to make a noise, and that the Lord would be their leader. And yet for the Lord to be there, and indeed our leader, they and we must be prepared to be led, uh, to let the Lord set out his agenda and then to follow his leadership. It means recognising his authority to lead us, it means being willing, happy for him to lead us, and it means submitting to his authority even when things are tough. When someone visits our church, uh, walks into the building and attends one of our services or other events, we hope and pray that they will find God to be here. Uh, it should be, at least in part, because of the way that we treat each other and the way that we live. Isn't the Lord among us? Now, of course, the guarantee of that is God's own promise, not our behaviour. But if we really love one another, people will know, said Jesus, that we're his followers. The danger, on the other hand, for us as Christians is that we take the Lord's presence for granted and start living, in practice at least, as if God were someone we can call on when we're really in trouble, but that for the rest of the time we can manage quite comfortably enough on our own. That's something of the background, although far worse than that, as we'll see, uh, in Micah's day in Israel. Now the passage of Micah chapter 3 breaks down into uh, three neat short sections, with verse 8 jumping out and hitting us in the middle. But before we get to that, we need to ask how Micah's thinking is working here. In chapter 2, God warned his people that he was about to bring evil on them because they were evil. And then he finished with this sign of hope, of a regathering. Whilst here in chapter 3, God is speaking again of judgment and destruction. So which is it to be? Well, the answer is both. Now, this is also the second of three main sections in the book, which begin with the term listen. Uh, the others are one at the start of the book, chapter 1, verse 1, and one at the start of chapter 6. And by the end of this section, the ears of those who've been listening will be tingling. Three sections then. Verses 1 to 4, awful political and judicial leaders. Uh, from verses 5 to 7, we see awful religious leaders. Then we see this kind of uh, break in that with the spirit of the Lord bursting in in verse 8 because we look at the last section, uh, which I've entitled Because of You. So, verses 1 to 4 then. Awful political and judicial leaders. Listen, leaders, aren't you supposed to know what is just? Uh, it's easy to throw stones at politicians, yet what should we be looking for in them? Who's the worst leader that you can think of? What made them so bad? I may have used this illustration before, but a few years ago in Mexico, one of the presidential candidates campaigned under the banner, I rob less, or I steal less. Maybe he was the most honest of the lot. <laughs> Corruption is worldwide, of course, but when the government and the judiciary and the police are all in cahoots, following self-serving policies, the vulnerable should tremble. And that's what was happening in Israel. The rulers were living it up at the people's expense. And those who should have been dispensing justice were living off the fruit of their abuse of it. Uh, the message is right on the button with its paraphrase here when it says, isn't justice in your job description? For if you can't find justice from a judge of all people, then where will you find it? And Micah's language, look at verses 2 and 3, is absolutely shocking. You who tear the skin from off my people and their flesh from off their bones, 
who eat the flesh of my people and flay their skin from off them and break their bones in pieces and chop them up like meat in a pot, like flesh for the cauldron. Remember, this is the people chosen specially by the Lord to be his holy nation and treasured possession. The people who are going to be a light to the nations, showing in part through their community spirit and their care for one another, how great was their God. And a thousand or so years on from uh, when they first received those instructions, where was the witness? Where was the neighbourly concern, the godly living? While those who should have been shepherds in Israel had transformed themselves into cannibals, at least metaphorically. They're ripping the people apart, and Micah portrays what one writer has called a blood-curdling depiction of indifference to human suffering and exploitation of the weak. Well, we've seen much of that through history, and sadly, we continue to see it today. The project supported by local churches in Bramhall, the International Justice Mission, uh, is one which works to mitigate the effects of what is often collusion between business people and local authorities via a bribe or whatever that allows innocent and vulnerable people to be enslaved or exploited. So in that sense, nothing has changed, neither has the responsibility of the church to speak or act against it. So where does that leave us, though? Uh, we might take a dim view of Downing Street drinks parties during lockdown or alleged backhanders between council members and local developers. But most of the time, I suspect that we rest on the checks and balances that exist or at the end of the day on the ballot box and the chance to vote out those that we think have done a rotten job. Every now and again, though, we hear about gross injustices that raise one's hackles and make us angry awful leaders, but worse is to come. Verses 5 to 7, the clergy, if I can use that term, are no better. In fact, they're in league with the rulers. Now, there is a long, dark history of church-state corruption and abuse of power, especially in Europe. It's the reason many in the last two or three generations have turned away from God, uh, including here in the UK. Um, I often recall a Spanish colleague saying to me that when people bemoaned the Catholic hold on power for so long there, that if Protestants had been in the same position, he was sure that they would have been even worse. Uh, Christians in politics is one thing, the church in politics is quite another. Keep the two apart, in my view at least. Who pays the piper? Well, in the case of most of the prophets of Micah's day, the rulers did. And they got what they paid for. You'd like a nice message from the prophet? That'll be £50. Can't pay or won't pay? Then I'm afraid a bit of denouncing's on the way. Wine and dine these prophets and they tell you anything you wanted to hear. Put nothing in their mouths and you'd be on the sharp end of their tongues. What a cosy arrangement they've got here. The prophets are well fed and the politicians get their sound bites and their religious backing. A moral majority indeed. Yet God sees all this and is about to act. Go back to verse 4 for a moment. The tables will turn. There will come a time when those who lorded it over others, who abused and exploited the poor and the needy, will themselves fall on hard times. Then they will cry out to God. But because they didn't listen to the cries of those they were treating so badly, neither will God listen to them. There is an element of final judgment in this, though the very real impending disaster of the Assyrian invasion was about to break on the northern kingdom, as well as that of Nebuchadnezzar's Babylon on the southern kingdom some 150 years later. Some wicked people, no doubt, die peacefully in their beds, but many don't. Justice is often served in this life, as God acts through earthly processes as well as heavenly ones, and yet we can rest on final justice. The judge of all the earth will most certainly do right. Which, when all is said and done, is our only hope, and especially is the only hope of the powerless, the weak and the vulnerable for whom God has a special concern. Now, evangelicals are quick and right to point out that here is no social gospel, uh, that ultimate release and freedom are spiritual commodities. 
Yet though it's true that Jesus' miracles were signs which pointed to his identity and to his mission as the promised Messiah, they were still miracles. When John the Baptist sent some of his followers to check on Jesus' credentials, what answer did the Lord give them? Go and tell John what you hear and see, he said. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, lepers are cleansed and the deaf hear, the dead are raised up and the poor have good news preached to them. Jesus was the whole person the prophet said he would be in both action and in character and books like Micah should be read in the light of that. It's true that full justice will not prevail on the earth until Jesus returns, but at many intermediate points in history, God intervenes on behalf of the suffering, particularly those of his people. Is the Lord among us? If he is, it will show in our concern for those in need around us and perhaps further from home as well, because otherwise the hypocrisy of the church will be seen by all and God's word and God's blessing may well be removed from it. That's exactly what was going to happen to the religious establishment in Israel. In verse 6 we read, the sun will set on these prophets. Now, a prophet without lights, without vision, without a word, well, it's a contradiction in terms. And there may be another word play here from Micah uh, that we can detect. Uh, the prophets will have nothing to say because they don't say what God wants them to say. So they will say nothing. They will flounder in the dark, as it were. The sun will set on this unholy alliance between statesmen and seers, between politicians and prophets. They will be ashamed and disgraced, verse 7, because there is no answer from God. Not that it's that God has nothing to say. He has nothing to say to them, but he has plenty to say about them. Um, perhaps you've seen one of those films uh, that finds corruption at every level. Uh, politicians who, while talking about a more equal society, are accepting backhanders from local business people who want to guard their tax-free interests. Uh, police who turn a blind eye to certain criminal practices so long as they get their cut. And religious leaders who take a pragmatic approach to the sinful world in which they live, encouraging their people to make the best of a bad job and not to mind cutting ethical corners to do so. In short, you can't trust anyone. Now, if you're anything like me, you'll be watching a film like that with part of you saying, come on, real life can't be that bad, while another part of you fears that actually it is. Well, this unholy trinity in 8th century BC Israel of rulers priests and prophets show that it often has been that bad and always has the potential in this fallen world to be that bad again. And yet God is not mocked, as Paul tells us in Galatians. Uh, and these prophets can't expect to ignore God's word and then suddenly hear from him when it suits them. Ignore God at your peril and face his silence when you seek his word. Harden your heart against God and you'll find it harder than you ever imagined and no way of softening it. Think of Pharaoh in Egypt. And sometimes are we not guilty of treating God and his word in a similar fashion? We turn to prayer when all else has failed. We open up the Bible in a moment of crisis. And yet the reason we're in a fix at all is because we haven't been consulting God or his word on a regular basis in our lives. It's not that God hasn't spoken. It's that we haven't been listening. God does speak through his word, but if we fail to consult it for long enough, wouldn't it be presumptuous to expect God to answer us on demand? He promises to respond to the broken and contrite heart. So when we open his word, do we genuinely want him to speak to us? Or do we just want a nice thought for the day? Awful political and judicial leaders awful religious leaders, and then the Spirit's power and proclamation in verse 8. The Lord bursts in. Praise him for that. He doesn't, he won't leave evil unchecked or his people unguarded. As for me, however, he says, uh, Micah writes in verse 8, I am filled with power by the Spirit of the Lord, with justice and courage to proclaim to Jacob his rebellion and to Israel his sin.'" 
Now, on first reading, that may sound a touch arrogant, and I think I would have expected such a statement to have come in the third person, spoken in by God about his prophet rather than coming from the prophet directly himself. And yet, if the Spirit really is in him, it will be undeniable. The Old Testament law designated two simple tests to expose someone who claimed to be a prophet of the Lord, but in reality was a fraud. Uh, the first was to check if their words came true. But the second test was that even if the prophecy did come true, did it lead people to God or to idolatry as a result? You can look at Deuteronomy 13 later in that regard. Now, in this second instance, God tells the people that he himself is testing them to see if they really love him. How will they respond to that prophecy? And Micah's boldness in telling the Israelite ruling elite these home truths to their faces shows that a power greater than his own was working in him. So just when you thought he couldn't get any clearer, listen to what the Spirit says in verses 9 to 12. Because of you. And Micah lists out all that the rulers and judges and religious leaders are doing wrong. They hate justice. They're violent. They accept bribes. They twist God's word. And to cap it all, they say, isn't the Lord among us? Well, yes, he is, but to punish, not to bless. They think everything in the garden is rosy. Probably because the situation has been going on for some time and the temple's still there and the, the structures are still there and they're still in power and doing very nicely out of it, thank you very much. Never mind that it comes at the price of fleecing the poor, attacking the vulnerable and generally making life miserable for the common people. And remember this again, this is the nation that God made, that God brought out of oppression in Egypt only for its rulers to end up oppressing their own people. Verse 10, who build Zion with blood and Jerusalem with iniquity. Now Israel was supposed to be a holy nation. And yet it was just as bad, if not worse, than its neighbours. Sometimes sections of the church have shown themselves to be similarly abusive or exploitative. And God does not stand idle, either at the wickedness in the world or wickedness in the church. So how might this apply at Ford's Lane? Because I'm conscious of what a preacher once said, that preachers should not concentrate on condemning sins that their congregations by and large are not committing, but on the ones that they are committing. Uh, while irrelevant denunciation is tantamount, he says, to silence on the sins that do exist, because they run the risk of giving the impression that nothing's wrong here. We're fine. Well, this calls for some self-examination. Uh, each of us will know the areas in which we personally struggle. Uh, we may also know something about those close to us for whom we can pray and to whom we can offer encouragement. Well, as a congregation, watch out for the danger signs. Complacency, perhaps. Isn't the Lord among us? Or nursing a grievance rather than forgiving. Lacking a genuine concern for the lost. Where might the problems lie? Well, let's pray that the Holy Spirit would come in power both to cleanse and root out the sin and then fill us so that we may proclaim his message of both judgment and hope, as Micah does, with justice and courage. There's one more point of irony in verse 10. They turned Jerusalem into a city where the shedding of blood was common. They were building a society on the use of violence. One day Jesus would come and through the shedding of his own blood, build a spiritual Jerusalem, a heavenly city which will last forever in peace and in justice. Particularly, he would bring it for those oppressed who cried out to him. Micah hasn't finished though. Verse 11, its heads give judgment for a bribe, its priests teach for a price, its prophets practice divination for money. So this would be a bit like attacking the royal family, the government and the Church of England all in one go. <laughs> well, perhaps not so hard to imagine after all. In other words, all the leading national institutions, everything that the state stands for, is dismissed by Micah as corrupt. The political and religious leaders are all the same. They're in it for the money. 
Now, such a denunciation shows that God is well aware of what's going on. Here is a word of discernment as well as one of prophecy. And the leaders would do well to realise that. This is God speaking to them. You know, you can be sure that the politicians didn't announce their bribes any more than some of our politicians announced their expenses until they were exposed, while the priests would surely have stressed the spiritual benefits of their teaching rather than their fees. But now it's all in the open. God has opened the books for all to see, and there is a lot to see. Yet they lean on the Lord and say, Is not the Lord in the midst of us? No disaster shall come upon us. There's no doubt about it. Religion makes you feel good. At least it does if you have, as so many do, a religious mindset. Walk into a religious building, perform a religious ritual and come out feeling a whole lot better about yourself and the world. A delusion, certainly, but no less common for that. Just look at the religious leaders in Micah's day. Corrupt, greedy, materialistic and yet leaning on the Lord. We're all right. We've got God on our side. And yet, as Micah goes on to say, not a, 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 sorry, as Micah goes on to say, a day was coming when not even the temple or the holy city would remain standing and God would depart from it. Because God demands holiness, first and foremost, a consistency between what we believe and how we live. And that is doubly true uh, for those in a position of spiritual leadership. The Israelite rulers and priests looked on the Lord as a kind of genie who they could summon up should the need arise. Now, the Lord has indeed promised to be in the midst of his people, among his people, but not with those who only masquerade as such, but whose lives are far from the conditions of the covenant given to Moses. And therefore, in the final verse, verse 12, the unthinkable is about to come to pass. Therefore, because of you... Zion shall be ploughed as a field, Jerusalem shall become a heap of ruins. Now, to the extent that his hearers took him seriously, it's hard to imagine the shock that Micah's words must have caused at this point. Bad enough that their capital city was going to be destroyed. Imagine our alarm if we were told that London was going to become a heap of ruins. But this is also God's city. The closest parallel for Christians today might be to say that heaven itself was going to be destroyed. Because Jerusalem is more than a city, the temple is more than a building. This is God's dwelling place on earth. Yes, there's a symbolic side to it, but there's a reality there as well. And to make the point even clearer, Micah uses the term high place. You remember that from chapter 1. In other uh, words, the temple mount uh, where God had directed his people to worship him, is going to become a defunct religious site, just like one of the old pagan shrines on the hilltops. Now, it's impossible to date Micah's prophecies with precision, but he was certainly used by God to bring King Hezekiah to his knees. And his words were remembered well enough a hundred years later to save Jeremiah from death, when it was pointed out that Micah had warned the people in similar terms to Jeremiah. God's word does not return to him empty. It reaps a reward, a reward in blessing for those who listen and obey it, but in judgment for those who reject it. And so how do we draw all this together for ourselves today? <clears throat> There's no doubt that the Church of Jesus Christ in every age needs leaders who are filled with power filled with the Spirit of the Lord, as Micah was. Uh, perhaps this was the exception before Pentecost, but it should surely be the rule after it. Preachers and teachers who are empowered to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ to a needy world, but also the implications of the gospel, of the Christian life, what it means to live as a follower of Jesus, to sin-threatened and sin-tempted congregations. The true prophet or preacher upholds God's standards, takes sin seriously and denounces it and holds on to the truth. And yet he does so in the spirit of John 3, 17. For God, did not send his son into, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. We proclaim the gospel so that people will be saved. 
Unless anyone doubt that God is serious, look back at what he said in this chapter. Uh, one writer, Alan, sums it up like this. He says the judicial sentences move from God's silence in verse 4 to his silence plus darkness in verses 6 and 7 to his absence when the temple is destroyed in verse 12. And if even God's own temple was not safe if misused, then certainly no church building or ministry today is safe if it moves away from God's word or moves away from a lifestyle that shows obedience to that word. Because of you, says the Lord, how much evil has been perpetrated by humanity down the ages. And yet, as that wonderful song puts it, there's another because of you that brings hope. There's a place where the streets shine with the glory of the Lamb. There's a way we can go there. We can live there beyond time. Because of you, because of your love, because of your blood. All our sins are washed away and we can live forever. Now we have this hope because of you. Oh, we'll see you face to face and we will dance together in the city of our God because of you. There is joy everlasting. There is gladness. There is peace. There is wine ever flowing. There's a wedding. There's a feast because of you, because of your love, because of your blood. Amen.